we'll be able to cover it in one time. <clears throat> we'll try to do our best. Uh, years ago, I'll start with a little story. Years ago, there was a great rabbi here in the United States. His name was Rabbi Pam. And uh, one time, one of his students came to him and says to him, Rabbi, what kind of a girl should I look for a wife? Uh, what, what I should I be looking for? So Rafam left, and he said, imagine you are in the Grand Central, and somebody is coming to you and says to you, excuse me, sir, what kind of train or which train should I pick? Which train should I go on? Which train should I board? It's, it's a crazy question because you need to know, first of all, where you want to go. The same thing here. Uh, in order to know where your life is, head, uh, hey, your life is heading, where you, what's your direction in life, you need to sit down and think about it yourself. And before you're going to pick up a mate, a soulmate, you really need to decide where exactly I'm going with my life. What is it that I'm looking in my life? And only then I can find a soulmate or a spouse that would help me uh, become a partner to reach this goal. Uh, a partner that would be a, a, uh, a contributor on this journey, which I call our life, to the, our desires, and whatever that is that we are looking for. One of the biggest problems when we're talking about, and I'm starting in a reverse order, because really this is a, supposed to know more or less, I mean we're supposed to talk about how we're going to find our mate, or to know if that's the right person, a little bit problems with, you know, with relationships. You should know that it's all connected. And the problems that we have, most common problems that we have in terms of relationship is the emotional problem. Uh, many years, many times it happens is throughout the years, years go by, and all of a sudden one of the partners in, that, in, the, in the bond that we call couple feels disconnected from the spouse, from the other person. And then the process of emotional death is occurring and slowly, slowly takes place in the relationship and there is a separation and that gap becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you can overcome it. Sometimes we say, listen, you know, habits kicks in. What can you do? You know, it is what it is. I got to carry on. I got to move on. It's not worth it to break the bundle. Let's just carry on with this. And this is really not the way to, to live life. And it's a very sad way to live life like this. You don't, you don't feel connected. Your kids realize that you realize it becomes a problem. Therefore, we need to really see <clears throat> what needs to be done in order to reach a state of spiritual and emotional connection that is going to be something quite deep that is going to last through years. If, let's say, average person, let's say, gets married when they're 25, you know, average you go 85, it's a 60-year partnership that you need to make sure it's going to last. That's not a joke. That's a, that's a heck of a commitment. And you need to have this in mind. And we need to ask really, what does it mean to have a good relationship in order to make it work? What makes a relationship to become a good relationship? And the, one major rule, one golden rule, the most fundamental thing about uh, the health of your relationship is to know where are you standing in regards to the truth. The truth, emet, is the core in which you can measure your relationship. How truthful you are to yourself, how truthful you are for the relationship, and so on and so forth. 
one needs to realize that everything that will be oppositional to the truth could never give you a sensation of truthful good, that it's good, without a doubt. I have no doubt that it's good. It's the truth that I'm feeling good. It has to be it. You can't fake the truth. A person can, can cheat himself, a person can tell himself lies, a person can bluff himself, but deep down inside, <clears throat> you really know that it's not it, and there's going to be a sensation of frustration, and uh, the frustration usually comes because of lack of truth in the relationship. You feel that your relationship is not genuine. And I'm going deliberately backwards to show you that the decisions that we're going to make on how are we going to pick this person or the other person. And by the way, if I'm using the word he or, or, you know, or she, it's just a general term. It's not, I don't want to become like in college, you know, he, she, you know, it's like, a, you know what I'm talking about. That frustration is, comes because you don't feel the truth in you. The relationship is not genuine anymore. You need to understand that emet, truth, is our reality. And there is a reality, there are two sides to it, to the truth. One side that the truth is ultimate. That there is no gap, there is no difference between good and bad, between love and hate. It's all one thing, one bundle. And there are truths that there is a gap between them. In other words, when there is no chemistry, and there is no, and there is a difference between love and hate. And there is time that you, there are people who do love their wives or their husband sometimes, and then sometimes they don't. And that's the truth as well. What kind of a truth do you want to be in is very important to determine how you're going to go about picking the person. And by the way, this is not just about how, I mean, because I see that there are many people here, or some people here are married. Some people I know for sure they're married. But this is not about, okay, uh, only for singles, how to pick a shidduch or not, because the mistakes are occurring all the time, and we could learn from that, because even if we made a certain mistake, we can fix it. The biggest problem in relationship, besides the truth, is lack of communication. Most people divorce because of lack of communication and something else that hopefully we'll get to the end and I'll get it to you and when we'll get to it we'll see it. So in that world of, of different perspectives of the truth, we need to choose exactly which one we want to live in. And you'll know that uh, we're going to talk about it. There is, there is, a, uh, there is a matter of working things out. There are going to be struggles in relationships. But if you understand, that's why I tried to tell you beforehand, if you understand that even the argument is done for the sake of the mutual truth, therefore there's no argument, there's not a problem. Everything could be worked out. But if we choose the other one, the other perspective of love and hate, my truth, your truth, it's very difficult to bridge it. So therefore, if we're going to look at good relationship, if you see relationships that work over a long period of time, and you're going to find along the way people that you know that were married for 40 years, for 30 years, for, for 50 years, and so on and so forth, if you're going to look very carefully at their relationship, you would realize that in the beginning, in the beginning of this relationship, there was nothing. There was no love. Where are the guys who were talking before about love, about loving God? There was no love. Love of a relationship comes and, and true love, true love comes only from appreciation, 
from realizing what the other person had done to you, what the other person had contributed to you and your relationship, only then and then only there is love. Don't mix love with other concepts of love. There's no such thing as love. This is true love. It starts and ends with appreciation. If you don't appreciate a person, if you don't appreciate a thing, whatever there will be, even God, you would not be able to reach the level of love. So therefore, a beginning of a relationship could not be based on love, because there's no such thing. <clears throat> if, uh, if you're going to have a... Uh, uh, you know, this, this process, uh, you know, uh, or this period of time where people fall into this great, uh, the great uh, uh, ladies, you can sit over here. You can come over here and sit. <clears throat> if you're going to look at relationship that really, you know, there's a great love started, so-called, and then what will happen is somehow along the, along the line, one party of the of the equation starts to do his own thing and they don't keep on the same pace all of a sudden one of them will feel trapped and that trapping the sensation of trapping indicates lack of balance in the relationship in order to understand that and to prevent yourself from a state of lack of balance in a relationship one needs to understand that the root of marriage or the root of problems in marriage started really in how we made the initial decisions in regards to who would be our soulmate. The problem did not start now. Problems don't occur out of, out of the blue. Problems start slowly, slowly. Whatever, even a decay in your tooth doesn't start all of a sudden. It starts slowly and it starts. The problem of marriage life started many times of how we made the decisions, how we make the decisions. So therefore we need to see how to make proper decisions, how to, make the, how to pick up our soulmate and to work with it. One needs to understand the fitting of a, of a hatama, a matching, proper matching of a couple is not only, if at all, a matter of physical attraction. According to the Kabbalah, a zivug ra'uy, an appropriate match, happens first of all on a spiritual level, in the spiritual realm. And only then it happens in the physical world. First of all it's spiritual, then it's physical. Therefore, one needs to understand that not to every person that we feel attracted to, we will be able to, to have a harmonious relationship. Most of the time we won't. We are looking at the wrong part of the equation. If you're going to ask biologists, if you're going to ask, uh, you know, the people of the science, they will tell you that there is no difference between us and animals in how we make decisions. We look at a person who is appropriate to mate, you know, in terms of our, our DNA, or whatever is, 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 is implanted into us, and this is how we make the decisions. There is nothing, you know, spiritual, it's all physical, and you could not be more wrong than that. In other words, we've been reduced, if we look at it like this, to a level of animals. And I've got to tell you that we're far from being animals. According to the Kabbalah, we come and we learn that things are not as simple as they are. Besides that natural tension between the sexes, between, the, between male and female, which is based on the need, on the natural need to multiply as a Kadosh Baruch who had planned to us. Many times we should know that, that emphasizing on external will create a disharmony in your relationship. The Maharchu, the Talmud of the Ari, wrote in Sefer Shara Gilgulim, and I'm quoting, Ka'asher ha'adamu chadash, when the person is new, in other words, 
when the first time he comes to this world, there is a batzug, there is a soulmate that is created with him. When it's the time for him to take her as a soulmate, it will happen like this. In an instant. Without any effort whatsoever. In other words, when the zivuk happens from the shoresh of the neshama, from the root of the soul, it's called zivug elion. Zivug elion means a superior matching. Therefore, when we separate, even if we say to somebody goodbye, you know, you're going on a journey from somebody like this, you, are, you feel like you're being torn apart from the person. I remember when I had to fly overseas on business, I, I was, I think, the most miserable person when I had to say goodbye to my wife. I was the most miserable person. People would say, hey, you're not terrific. You're flying business class. You're a big shot. You're going here. You're going there. I was miserable. I hated it. I was not looking forward to fly overseas. I hated every minute of it. So when you separate it, you have mamash yesure nefesh. It's, it's torturing. It's, it's, it's torture to your soul. But that is also uh, uh, in, in ratio to how much you invest in your relationship. The more the investment, the greater the pain of separation. Why? Because you really feel you're losing a part of yourself. If Chaz V'Shalom Sabi needs to have his teeth pulled, it's excruciating pain. Imagine Chaz V'Shalom to rip a limb out of you when, you when you're wide awake even more so when you feel like your soul is being torn out of its place you're living in here and you're going away or the other way around human connection human kesher human attachment is first of all and most of all spiritual not physical don't mistake that. If you make your decision based on he looks good, she looks good, you are heading towards a problem. So what happens, for example, if you already did that, and you're kind of getting along. So before things will go bad, stop and start enhancing your connection, your relationship. Start doing things together that together will help you grow spiritually. You can fix it. You can fix it even if you make that mistake. And there are many ways to enhance your spiritual connection between the two. And, and being romantic, it's only after you're getting married. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Only a person that is strong he would be willing to open his, his heart out to reveal his emotions to his spouse. Weak people or people who are scared or feel vulnerable will never be able to do that. We need to understand that when our, we need to reach that level <clears throat> that when Adam Arishon, according to the Midrash, he had the previous wife. He didn't like her. He couldn't see her. She was, she was attached to him. He couldn't see her. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu put him to sleep and he created Chava. And he says, ah, this one, that's the one I like. She's a bone of my bones. She's a flesh of my flesh. That's my wife. It needs to be as clear to us as, as, as it was to Adam Arishon that this is my wife or this is my husband. This is my other, this is my other part. It says, the Gemara says that 40, everybody knows that. That 40 days, thanks. Thank you. Take one. That 40 days before, before a person is, Valad uh, Notzar, a person is created, there's a heavenly voice. There's a heavenly voice that says, This one is going to marry that one. So, therefore, the Zivug is really Mishamayim. So, that's very nice. But how could we. How, what do we do today that we don't hear this bat call, this heavenly voice? How do we know that that's the one? So they say on the Chazonish, Chazonish was a great rab that lived in Eretz Israel uh, in the 20th century. 
He said, when a person feels the willingness to live together, to tie the knot, as they say, with the other person, that willingness is the heavenly voice inside that tells you, that's the one, that's the one, that's the one. Willingness. Well, that's the Chazonish. You know, he was very sensitive. He was on a very high level. And he was able to do that. Well, that's the one. There's no question. But what happened to us when we don't have this ability to accept our sensations and go along with it? When we are not as sensitive as he was to that? How do we go about? Very simple. Get ready for hard work. And... <clears throat> We need to understand that the Shiduch starts, the process of a soulmate starts from us. That is, we need to, first of all, work on ourselves. Thank you. Thanks. We need to work on ourselves. We need to know who we are. We need to know what we're good at, what we're bad at where we need strength, strengthening, where we can contribute, we need to know ourselves. Most people are afraid of that. Most people don't want to sit with themselves and say, I am good at that, I am weak in this. That's why most people don't have it right. You have to forget about this, you know, <clears throat> Hollywood style mates of uh, fireworks and, uh, and ah, you know, and teary eyes and, uh, you, know, you know, Mickey Mouse cartoon with the, with the hearts flying out. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. That absolutely doesn't happen. You're not, you're not going to have a, uh, I wouldn't say a knight in shiny armor. You're not going to have a prince in a silver BMW or a uh, princess from the, from the fairy tales. Oh, yes, sir, and so on and so forth. You're not going to have that. Uh, if you are thinking of, uh, about that, you'll be prepared to something that might be a little difficult for you to acknowledge. It might be that the right one has come your way and you either missed it or rejected it because you were not ready. As we said before, you did not know where do you want to go with this train that you call your life. Since you did not know what you want to do with your life, what's your goals? in your life, you miss the right one, and they might come your way. So before you go on this journey, you must work on yourself. You have to be very honest. Remember we said the truth. The truth starts with us, the individual. We have to be truthful, first of all, to ourselves. Only then we can offer the truth to somebody else. Otherwise, we can't. You cannot demand something from someone if you haven't done it yourself. Are you a truthful person? That's a very important question. And <clears throat> we, we have a lot of misconceptions about this whole who is the right one? How do I find how do I find the right one? Uh, to know if we are people who would be very comfortable with superficial relationships. Some people are very comfortable with that. Are we able to put to the side our old views, all our superstitions, all our predetermined thoughts that we had before and on a person? Are we going to put all these things to decide that we thought are good and we know they are not, and now we're willing to face the truth the way it is? Are we willing to admit that the person that we thought is like, we thought is perfect for us based on other things is really not the person for us? It's not the right suit. It's not the right one. There are some people who would be drawn to relationships, who would allow them to continue with their lives as it was before the relationship had started, before this partnership had started. 
There are people, the same people who would allow their bad habits or the negative habits not to interfere in this thing together. They're going to kind of sweep it, everything under the carpet. And basically what we're talking about is a relationship of, that is based on comfort and leisure. Nobody is ruffling anybody's feathers. It's all good. I come with my own bad sack. You come with your own bad sack. It's okay. We're free. One needs to understand that there's never going to be love in this relationship. To so this kind of a relationship, the partner is no more than an object in the collection. This person collects objects. And you are another object in this collection. To most people who look for a person as a mate, the main thing is to have the match is uh, chemistry. Everybody's talking about chemistry, which is quite interesting because if you ask the average person, most of the people hated chemistry, and yet chemistry is number one there in the priorities. You know, you know, and we look, uh, do we get along with each other? Are we comfortable together? Uh, do we always have to say one to another? Which is always bothering me. Sometimes, and many times I hear this, people say, you know, we always have something to say. I don't think it's good. I think a person should feel, if it's, if it's a true relationship, should feel very comfortable being in the presence of another person without saying a word. Why do you always have to say something? Life is not one big Twitter that you always have to twit. We're not birds. <laughs> So you should be able to sit down with the person that you love, so-called, and feel very comfortable not saying a word. Change the way you look at things. Another criteria is, is everything going smooth to us? You know, we never argue. There's never this. There's never that. We don't have any conflicts. Uh, do they have money? You know, it's very important. Do we have money? Uh, does she look good? Is he a good looking guy? Exactly. Like the guy, you know, he reminds me so much the guy from the movie, I don't know, give me a Tom Cruise, I don't know, whatever. Man, he looks so much just like him and so on and so forth. You know what? I guess that is my shidduch. That's the right one for me. He looked just like the guy from the movie. She looked just like the other person. You know, the way she does the hair, just like Angelica Jolie in uh, <laughs> Tourists from France, whatever. I know, in Love in Paris, you know, Venice, or whatever it is. Really, our standard of which we determine, and again, if we did this already and we are in a relationship and there is something to work, don't break it. Just change your outlook together. Change your outlook. Start looking together at things that are really important. According to, to, to our tradition, right, we say that a zivug, and zivug is not something that you just make the person, you make the shidduch and go on. It's a process is as difficult as Kriyat Yamsuf, as splitting of the, Red o of the Red Sea. It's a very difficult process. So a person that goes into a relationship needs to know that there are going to be bumps along the way. And it doesn't make a difference who you're going to come your way. There are always going to be obstacles in the way, even if it's so-called Zivug Min Hashamayim. Perfect relationship would never occur without effort and by itself. Yes, ma'am. What kind of obstacle is that? Any obstacle. If it's from time and then how is it showing an obstacle? Like if you're meant to be with that person, why is it obstacle? I'll tell you in a second. I'll tell you in a second. But I'll tell you why. I mean, what kind of obstacle? Obstacles could be anything. It's just a matter of, like, for example, let's say he got used to put his shoes in a certain way and you don't like it. And, you know, it's an obstacle because you decide to say something, he says, that's the way I like it, and so on and so forth. Uh, the way you view things. You could have opposing opinions on things and still have a perfect match, if you understand that. But if you decide to make it into an obstacle, into a problem, there will be. For example, let's say, let's say uh, you know, the guy that you marry, you're going to marry, he likes to go out. 
and you are more like a homegirl. You know, I don't like to go out. Or the other way around. <laughs> right? You like restaurants. He doesn't like restaurants. Now it becomes a problem. That's an obstacle. It's not going to be whatever I like, she likes, she likes, what I like, we are. It's never going to happen. These are obstacles. But there's a reason for that. Uh, how do we know? How do we know that uh, that we are that we are doing the right things? If everything falls into place perfectly and there is no tension, you have a bad relationship. Especially in the beginning. If everything is perfect, something is missing. It's impossible. You're taking two human beings, two worlds, and you're trying to collide them together to fuse into one thing, which is going to call the family cell. No kids yet. But just the fact that it's going to work. It's like taking two planets and trying to crush them together to fuse into one. It's impossible without some impact, without some explosion, without some, you know, shattering. Impossible. If it happens, it never, you don't have a relationship. You just don't have a relationship. Something is missing in that thing. Again, to a limit. To a limit. And it has to be a sincere investment in that relationship of good intentions and tremendous energy. You have to be very willing to, I mean, to come to work with a lot of koach, with a lot of energy to make this thing work. You have to realize you've got to roll your sleeves and got to do it. Exactly, that's your answer. Exactly as, and it's in the world, when this world was created, Akadosh Baruch Hu created out of effort. There was a first day, there was the second day, and so on and so forth. Shabbat, the ah, resting, came only after we had obstacles. Things didn't work out so well. This came like this. He planned, you know. The plan was uh, to make my, you know, <clears throat> uh, to say uh, this was good also on a Monday. It didn't happen. That's why he said it twice uh, on Tuesday, you know, two for Tuesday. There were obstacles. It's a process. Everything has to be a process. And if you don't work, if it's automatic, it means you're skipping the process. And if you skip the process, you have nothing. Everything in this world, everything. If I'm going to ask you, what's your name? Zippy. Okay, Zippy. She said Zippy. She said Zippy. Uh, let's say, for example, you're going to go to a PhD, okay? You want to become a PhD in psychology, clinical psychology. How's that? Good enough? Or, that's what you want, you see? Don't worry, I'm not a prophet. I wanted it also. I just couldn't afford it. <laughs> But well, let's say, for example, you decide to go. You decide to go to Harvard University. Good enough? Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> Full scholarship means you are a genius. But listen, for me, eh, Harvard. You know, I want to have the time. You know, I'm going to go to some. Uh, uh, no, I, I would say that. <laughs> Don't get me into trouble. They're going to go to some online, uh, online uh, you know, PhD program that would not give me too much of a hard time, does not really ask me if I'm illiterate or not. You know, uh, one of those things, as long as you pay your money, you're okay. After two years, you wrote something, then you get your PhD in clinical psychology, right? Guess what? You go to the market, you're a PhD. I go to the market, I'm a PhD. Are we the same thing? No. Of course not. Why? Our knowledge would be the same. Yes, in, in reality, she's going to be a PhD, I'm going to be a PhD, technically we're okay. Practically, there's a big difference. I would know nothing, she will be the real thing. Why? I have to put effort. And the effort has to take time. It does not happen by itself. It's against nature. There's no bria yesh mi'ayin. You know, poof, there's nothing, and all of a sudden, there's something. There's always... 
always a process of things that occur. Always. If you skip the process, you have nothing. You can't reach Shabbat if you didn't work six days. HaKadosh Baruch Hu could have made the work like this. Perfect, from beginning to an end. It was to show us that there is a process. Building a family, it's a process. It's a process, it's a process, it's a process. But I mean, okay, so when Shabbat comes, Shabbat will come. But don't forget, even Shabbat, you need to keep Shmo. Shmo v'zachor. It means even after your relationship had already reached a level of you understand each other on a telepathic level, you still need to maintain it. You need to keep it. You need to make sure that it's working as a precious thing. Because guess what? Come Shabbat, you flip the switch, you desecrated Shabbat. With a flip of the switch, with a flip of the switch, you could destroy a relationship that you invested so much into. You have to keep it. And you have to remember. Shamo v'zacho. What do I have to remember? I have to remember why did I start it to begin with. And when the difficulty will come, I need to remember that that's the person that I chose to go through to the best of my ability, to my best of my judgment. I wasn't forced to. I did it as clear-minded. You have to remember the days, and there are going to be times it's going to be hard. But you're going to have to remember why did you start it. Okay, but when do you know when it's enough to go to the obstacle? Like when do you say it's enough me going to enough for that? Depends what obstacles are. If the obstacles are there and you are both working on it together, that's one thing. But it's always you against me. That's not going to happen, ever. And that's a problem that we're going to tackle Besot Hashem a little further. Okay, when you go to the beach and you surf, right, there are waves. You're hoping they're going to be waves. Why? Because you want to have fun surfing. At a certain point, when the waves are becoming too big to your skills, you're going to make a conscious decision. Either I'm going to get tumbled over and I'm going to get drowned or who knows what's going to happen, or I'm just going to walk out. But as long as there are waves and you are going anticipating the wave, sometimes those obstacles that we call obstacles, the difficulties of forming a relationship, is the fun of getting to know the person. You, feel, you should feel so comfortable to address yourself spiritually in front of the person and to build yourself together as one unit spiritually. That needs tremendous, tremendous strength to do that. Weak people don't do it. And usually weak people are selfish as well. But that's really the end of our lecture today. You guys tell me where you want me to stop, I'll stop. I can go for a long time. A relationship, which is the best relationship. Huh? What? With the camera rolling? Okay. Up to you. <laughs> Is a relationship that works in a divine and wonderful way. It's full of soul. It's full of spirit. There's a tremendous thought that goes into this relationship all the time. Tremendous consideration, mutual consideration. It is complete. That is, you don't feel that you could have made a better decision. You could have made a better thing. It is concentrated on... Giving to people, it's not a selfish relationship. It is sincere and has a lot of depth to it. It's full of meaning and is pleasurable and contributing to both members of the, of the, of the family cell of the couples. This kind of a lifestyle never comes easy, ever. But couples that reach this level are usually we call a match made in heaven. Even this world was made in heaven by a Kadosh Baruch Hu, right? It was not made complete. The whole fun of reaching Shabbat is going through it and completing it. When you reach that level, it's called a match made in heaven. And again, do not forget 
that there is a chance that we're going to meet the right one and we're going to reject it because of lack of willingness to do so. So therefore, how do we know that we meet the right person? That's the most difficult question. And one way or another, almost everybody asks themselves one time in their life, uh, and very few people actually get a good, solid answer, uh, which is going to help them deal with sometimes endless list of demands that they put, well, he has to have this, she has to have this, and so on and so forth. It's endless. It's, it's impossible. So how do you make this decision uh, without getting overwhelmed with the data that you have? First of all, uh, if you decided to marry someone, you have to make sure that that individual is completely committed to, the, to some objective standard of something. He's committing himself to something. People that have a problem committing to something, a value, virtue, something, uh, that is not willing to contribute from himself to others, is a person that is extremely self-selfish. And at the time of crisis, and we all face times of crisis in our lives, is going to become your biggest obstacle. A person who is self-centered. Therefore, a person who is willing to commit himself for others to help is a person who is going to help you and the relationship when the time comes. How does this person treat others? You can measure the person, the right person, by the way he, she, it treats others. If you want to marry somebody who's going to take care of you or treat you nicely, how exactly are you going to check it out? Very simple. How do they treat other people as you observe? That's why you go on dates. You need to see how this person is behaving in other people. If you go, for example, to a restaurant and it treats the waiter or the waitress in a bad manner, guess what? Next time is you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, but it can all be a show in the beginning. It's very hard to put a show for a long time. You're right. But you know what? You catch the person on the things that he least or least actually uh, think of, pay attention, things that will come to him normal. For example, very hard to hide the way a person drives. Okay? <laughs> very difficult. If you're driving with a person and he's aggressive in the, in the street. And therefore, why is he trying to show, or she drives aggressively, right? If, you give it, if you're a real man, you get let her drive, right? What if you teach her how to drive? <laughs> I didn't know we're in that relationship already. <laughs> okay? I'm just using it as an example. Something that you do all the time. Or regularly, you do, you, it will be very hard for you to fake it because it, it's in your subconscious. You don't pay attention. But if the person drives aggressively, he probably is an aggressive person. I disagree. Huh? I disagree. I beg to differ. You could, but it, it really shows up, right? It, uh, yes? That's another way, absolutely. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But it takes a while, and that's the danger. You brought a tremendous point. See them in their natural environment, family, and so on and so forth. But sometimes by the time it gets to the family, it might be a little too late in the relationship. You had invested so much that you say, well, you know, you start to compromise. Or you're trying to make excuses. Why is it working? I mean, I already met the family and so on and so forth. But you're right. You're right. Friends and so on and so forth. Uh, anything. Just observe the person. If, uh, you know, the person makes faces. Again, girl, boy, you know, makes faces. Next time, you're going to be the one who's going to make faces to. Are, are you able to deal with that? Are you a person who's going to say, oh, I don't make If she makes faces like this, you know, whatever face they make, you know. 
Are you going to be able to deal with that? You need to see the people, how they behave in the most natural way to determine really how they are. It's very difficult to hide how you are. It's very difficult to be, it's near impossible to be at home an angel and outside a monster. It's just impossible. It's very hard. You need to look at the person, how they communicate. And it's not only for girls against boys, the other way around, for all of us. What's their communication skills? How do they communicate with each other? They know how to talk. Are they able to, to verbalize themselves? Because if you have a problem, some people just keep their mouth shut, they keep their mouth shut, they keep their mouth shut, and all of a sudden it's an eruption of a volcano, and it's all gone. How do they communicate? If the person cannot communicate, and you uh, communicate with a person, you're going to have a problem. Check how the person acts when they're angry. Don't get them angry. <laughs> but it does happen. I don't know, they deliver the wrong one, the wrong one. You order steak, they give you schnitzel. <laughs> okay. Now, how are you going to act? Is the person a, how should I say it, a, uh, a very demanding person? Is a person a prima donna? Prima donna only for girls, for guys also. Are they prima donnas, right? Because guess what? Next time around, it's going to be you. You're going to be on the other side. How you deal with that? Many times we pick the wrong person because we expect the person to change or we feel that the person could change if they only marry us Without a doubt, I'll fix it. There's never a problem, but I will be able to fix it. It's never going to happen. Don't expect people to change for you, and don't expect to change people either. It just does not happen. Sometimes uh, we concentrate on everything else besides the personality of the person. You know, there are people who know how to talk well, but there's no personal chemistry. There are people who are afraid to form relationships. Again, people who are afraid to tell their feelings, and so on and so forth. Very difficult. You have to check if the person is humble. Being humble is a tremendous thing. Yes? Um, let's say you both face, like, conflict and, and it costs, it's something that you're both never used to. It's like you're trying to like make a relationship work and you realize that you're both wrong and then is that considered making someone change for you? No, if you're both wrong, you say, listen, you know, I was wrong, you were wrong. Like the way that you reacted to a situation was so and so and it caused a problem, but if you tell him or her like, you can't really react this way, or that, is that considered changing? That's no, that, I think, first of all, if you're able, first of all, to reach the stage of saying, you know, I acted wrong, and I know what I did wrong, and you're willing to admit that you're a tremendous, strong person to do that, if the person across from you is not able to deal with that, well, you got the wrong person on hand. Okay, and if you tell him or her that you're, you know, you should have done this and this, and they agree with you, and they're willing to change, but... That still, that willingness to change is a tremendous thing, but still is a very difficult thing to do. Why? Very simple. How many times do we know that we did the wrong thing, and it's still extremely difficult for us to change ourselves? So as much as it's hard for us to change ourselves, how could I expect the other person to change? It's just as hard for them. Okay, so let me, I'll skip a few stages. One of the things that actually make a relationship not work so well, and when there is a spiritual gap to begin with. If, for example, you're dating a person that is not holding, nor willing to make the step forward, because the, their argument will be, which is a you know, certain extent a valid argument, why should I change 
It's a relationship. Maybe you should change for me. Why should I change for you? Okay? It's, a, it's an argument. But a person like this indicates to us that there's a tremendous spiritual gap in between that most likely would not be able to overcome. If we said beforehand that the most important thing in a relationship is the spiritual connection, and in the spiritual connection we have a gap, what are your chances to really succeed? I think near to nothing. It's just not going to work. If it happened that you're already in a relationship, and I'm not talking about boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, and so on, I'm talking about a husband and wife, which happens, therefore it determines on your ability to communicate, to try to bring it to a uh, solution that will be appropriate to all through a communicative process. Because it's not about you and me, it's about us, the family. And we talk about it. If we can't talk about it, we neglected the problem. Communicative skills, very important. We were saying earlier that relationships make it work. Both spouses have to put effort into it, right? What if the effort is to change, not only to make the relationship better, but to make the person better as himself? You can't change anybody else. Not try to change the other person. Yourself? Yeah. That's terrific. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, it's, not, it's terrific. That's the whole concept of tshuva. I realized I did something wrong. I made tshuva. I'm sorry. I made tshuva. I'm willing to change. But nobody can make you do that. Even God himself is not interfering in, is forcing you to change. If you want to change, he said, I'll help you. I'm not going to force you. If you want to change, I'll help you. you think a man and a wife have distinct roles? Husband and wife. Husband and wife, sorry. Husband and wife have distinct roles between, like... Who does what? Like, and uh, or should it be like 50-50? He washes one dish, she washes one dish. <laughs> Absolutely not. I just know it's a very common question. Like, Absolutely not. Listen, I do dishes. Uh, and actually, my girls do dishes. I cook. I help, I do the laundry. Doesn't make me less of a man. I realize that that one needs to be done at home. My wife comes home late. She drives 80 miles every single day to work. Somebody's got to do it. If I'm going to say, well, I'm the husband, I'm the man, I'm not doing that. We have a problem here. I'm going to be the one who's actually undermining the family cell. It's not about me. It's about us. So therefore, what difference does it make? Who does it? It's get done. We're all contributing to the same goal. That's to make this thing work. So it doesn't make a difference who does what. Now, yeah. The learning change like towards religion, most of the time you're not asking the person to change who they are. You're asking them to change their view or, or to find a certain attraction to want to do it or to become more knowledgeable in it. You're not saying change who you are, change your mentality. Yeah, but that's already saying that we have a problem here. That's another issue that we I want to, to touch is the issue of do we share the same goals in how are we going to see the relationship, the family? Do we share the same values? If we don't share the same values, there's nothing really to talk about. But it takes time to learn each other. But it's a question, do we or can we? <laughs> if you don't know what's going Therefore, your starting point, your starting point has to be as close as possible or along parallel lines. If you, for example, are running this way, and I'm going this way, right? We're going to overlap. If we're going like this hand to hand, parallel, we can continue forever. We're always going to see the same line. And that's how it has to be husband and wife. Not one behind the other, not one in front of the other. Neck and neck. Always. But therefore, if you're starting here, and she's starting there or the other way around, what are the chances for you to actually reach head to head? Usually I'll tell you that between you and me and everybody else. Usually it's the other way around. Yep. Usually it's the other way around. Yes. Ruby. Um, I want to ask, let's say um, towards the religious aspect, right? And being both, both, the, um, both people in the um, relationship were, are religious. Or not religious, sorry. Now one strives to be religious, but the other one does not want to, does not want to go. 
towards uh, religion at all whatsoever. It's it's a it's an accident bound to happen. Right. So now what's the And it's not only it's not only in that. It's not only in that. It's in anything that they don't see eye to eye. It's already you creating here already a gap. And it's not only we using religion usually is like a major thing. It could be for the fact that the woman she wants to go to work. He says, No, you're not going to work. It's a gap. They don't see eye to eye. Yeah, but I think certain other things you can you can try to avoid, you know? So therefore you need to understand that at that point, you make a priority list. What's the most important thing? Is the relationship important or I'm more important or whatever it is more important? If the relationship is more important, so what's the big deal? So I'll give up a little bit. So what if she doesn't? Huh? What if the person doesn't? Well, therefore, it's your call. That's what I'm saying. That's at, a cer- at a certain point, you've got to break it. So let's say the guy doesn't want to do it. He does, he, he's like, I'm not, I'm not going for religion. I'm sorry to be you. Before we got married, we, you know, we were happy. Now they have a problem. Blah, blah, blah. They have a problem. If it's not going to be it on religion, it's going to be in something else. She's going to tell him, fine, I'll give it up. Not a problem. It's going to come up somewhere else. It's an accident about to happen. What about compromises? Who asked that? Me. Who's me? Ah, hey. That's why I said. Both sides, if it's important, if the relation is important, both sides will give up something. But if they don't share the same values, nobody will be willing to, to give up. It's an it's, it's a crash. It's a head-to-head collision. That's what's going to happen. And you need to make a decision. What's the most important thing to you? Now, I'm going to skip some things. I want to tell you the following. But other things you need to look at people is good character. What's the character of the person? It's very important. How the person is doing with the Yirat Shamayim. Very important. The famous Shidduch that was succeeded in the Torah, we read it a few weeks ago. Eliezer, you know the story. Eliezer, Abraham sent him to get a kalat to his wife. You know the story with the camels and so on and so forth. Eliezer was looking for something, a specific thing. He was looking for a woman who is Ba'alat Chesed. If you ask yourself the question, what in the world is so important in Chesed? The answer is very simple. Avraham Avinu, to reach where he, the place that he got in history, was through a complete selfless act when God told him, get up, leave everything behind, and go. Abraham did it. Selfless. Abraham gave from himself to others. Eliezer knew that only a selfless woman would be able to fit in the household of Abraham Avinu. It's the only way it's going to work. That's why he does his test. If you want a relationship, you want a strong indication if this relationship is bound to succeed or not, one thing, leave all the rest I said before. Look if this person is willing to bring about from himself or herself act of chesed. If, in other words, are they selfish or they're not. If this person is not willing to contribute for himself for no other reason because besides doing the right thing, they're doing the good thing, you going to have a problem it is not a person that you want to raise your kids to because one day he or she would leave you because it's not going to be convenient for them anymore because they are selfish selfishness is what destroys marriages more than anything else the misbeach when we we said when a family divorces the misbeach cries on them why because when a person made a mistake, made a mistake, you bring a korban. But when a person does an act of selfishness, he's selfish. He simply does not care. There is no korban, no sacrifice that you can bring for the fact that you don't care. It is impossible, impossible to have a healthy relationship with somebody who does not care, 
who is not willing to give for himself, to volunteer, to help others, to help weak people, to help those who are not as fortunate as you. If you want one indication, if that is the right person, again, male or female, are they ba'alei chesed? They're able to do that. If you see that the person is a ba'al chesed, we can work on the rest. This is the most important thing. This is, the, this is why the story of, of Eliezer is so big for us. To teach us how to pick up the right shidduch. So you're going to ask the person also. Are they doing any chesed? Are they contributing? For all the people who arranged this thing here, it takes effort. And it took also a little bit of bending back because we need to do what we need to do. It was an act of chesed. For people to contribute time and money. For people who contribute open, you know, we had the, the hurricane. The stories that I heard, how wonderful they are. A person I heard went to the store. His house got a little... Uh, they, he bought and bought and he bought. The store owner said, I'm not taking a penny from you. It's all free. People open the houses. This is what it is to be a Jew. And it is in any one of us. And I'll tell you why it is so important. Because when you are selfish, you are capable of doing tshuva. Because you are not selfish. You do your own personal lech lecha. A person that can do the personal lech lecha is a person who is capable of doing tshuva. If you can do tshuva, you can forgive. You can forget. You can do chesed. You can help. You care. This is a person who is appropriate to build that. If you have problems, though, with your marriage, and your marriage doesn't really work so well, and you see it's getting bumpy, I'll tell you something. Start to contribute together to a chesed organization. Both the husband and wife contribute your time to go to do something of chesed. Do something. Help people. Start some charity organization. Go see how unfortunate people are. Maybe you come home, you realize how really good you have it. On that, the Torah says, Olam chesed yevane. A world of selflessness would be built. This is the only thing that brings Mashiach. That and Talmud Torah. So I thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it because I did. <laughs>